Grace and peace, all my people of the faith, brothers and sisters, greetings, greetings, greetings. Um, let's see. So today, the topic is sin. So we're talking about sin today. Um, this is one of those subjects where, you know, a lot of people have some confusion about, you know, believers and unbelievers alike. You know, it's one of those topics that's like, you know, it's 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 tough. It's tough, you know. So I know um recently I've been asked this question, you know, by some people. Well and, and this this come up often also, you know, but recently, you know, someone asked me, an unbeliever asked me, like, hey, you know, what is the difference between, you know, a sinner and somebody that's saved, what is the difference between them? Well, I'm going to tell you, you know, the biggest difference, there, there's like a number of differences. The most important difference, the most important and the most major difference is that people that save and people that serve Christ, people that's been redeemed by the blood of Christ, people that's been born again by the Spirit of God, you know, they confess Jesus' name, you know what I'm saying? They believe in their heart, you know, uh, they bear fruit, they've been baptized, you know, and they really living this thing out. Those people, well, that's just it. They called upon the name of the Lord. They confess the name of Jesus. So, they confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's the biggest difference is they accepted him and they didn't reject him. You know, they accepted the name of Jesus. You know, they didn't deny him. That's the biggest difference is that they actually accepted him, you know. And uh, so that's that's the number one thing, you know, is calling upon the name of the Lord. So, but after that, you know, number two. You know, and, and it's really no numbers to it, but that was just like, that's the main thing, you know, is accepting Christ. If you don't do that, is you know, you, you can never get to this point. So that's something that has to be done, you know. You draw close to him, he draw close to you. But now what comes into play is, you know, what's the difference between us? The difference is believers... We don't practice sin, so we don't willful sin. To practice sin is to willful sin. Well, what do it mean to practice sin? What does it mean to willful sin? That means to basically sin, and it's your lifestyle. That's a it's a repeating lifestyle over and over and over, and that that's a lifestyle that you live. So you sin without any regards to God. You don't regard how the most high God feels about what you're doing. You don't feel guilty about what you're doing. You know, you, you, you don't feel shameful. You don't feel guilty. You don't have any remorse. You just go along continuing to sin as if it's nothing. It's nothing to you. And that's, and, and this is daily. This is every day and all day is it doesn't cease. That's what the lifestyle of an unbeliever who is not saved, who is not born again, that's what their lifestyle looks like. A person who is born again and who's been redeemed by the great redeemer, you know, Jesus, the Christ, Yahshua, the Hamashiach, a person that's been redeemed by his blood is a person who... They live a lifestyle of a holy lifestyle. Now, what does that mean? That means that they're set apart. They don't live like the world. Now, the world is everybody who's unbelievers. Everybody who's unbelievers and who reject Christ. That's what's considered the world. Now, people who follow Christ, they, um, they don't live like the world. You know, but they live holy. So they live 
a strict lifestyle. And what is the strict lifestyle? It's based off of the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the Bible. You know, it said Jesus is the word made flesh. So the teachings of Jesus, that's the strict lifestyle that we live. We're not seeking to go out and pleasure our flesh, you know, living however we want. You know, going out, having sex with any and everybody, using drugs and, you know, all the things that's sinful to the body and that's sinful to us and sinful to God. We're not going out looking for those type of sinful pleasures. We're not looking for that. As a matter of fact, we're practicing on rejecting those things. We're pra Every day, we're practicing denying ourselves. That means to deny our flesh. That means... Uh, rejecting ourselves. That's what it means when Christ talks about in the gospel when he says, you know, to pick up your cross. That's what it means to pick up your cross is to deny yourself, you know. And so to die to yourself every day. When Paul said to die is to gain, he talked about dying to himself. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about rejecting his fleshly desires. Because we're human, our flesh desires sinful uh, things, you know, and that, that's just the nature of the flesh. It's nothing, it's not an anomaly. That's simply the nature of the flesh, period. Because we all human, we desire those things. You know, we don't have our full habitation of who we are because we're in this human flesh, you know. So, but, so that's, that's the thing when it comes to, um, being saved or not being saved. So, People who are saved, uh, what happens is we still sin. Because I have unbelievers say, well, I sin, you still sin, so what's the what's the deal? How, how, how are you going to be in the kingdom? You know, you sin like I sin. You know, well, it's not like you sin. It's, it is a difference between a sin. You practice sin, I don't practice sin. I'm not premeditating it every day like, oh, writing the list down. Like, okay, I'm going to go here tonight. Then I'm going to go do this. I'm not writing it down and premeditating my sin. Every All throughout the day, every day, I'm practicing denying my flesh and denying uh, the temptations that come to my flesh that I don't sin. But being that I'm in human flesh, we still going to sin. But here's the, and, and here's the, the, the impact of the difference is though we sin, the Holy, this is how you know that the Holy Spirit is working in you as a believer. The Holy Spirit will convict your heart. What is conviction? You know, if you get convicted, it will convict your heart. Or, and this is what's called godly sorrow. I talk about this in the book of Titus. The Holy Spirit will convict your heart. And that will bring you to a point of, that, that conviction will bring guiltiness it'll bring shamefulness you know and you would this is what a believer will feel you know once the holy spirit convicted you from the sin that you did you know that you did wrong you're going to feel guiltiness you're going to feel shameful and feeling that way is going to lead you to repentance now and so this is another step in it is when we talk about repentance and you have a lot of uh, people that believe that repentance is, excuse me, they, they would say that repentance is just uh, changing your mind, just or, or changing your mind or just turning away from sin. Now, this is mostly, um, this is like a, like a big discussion, you know, uh, 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 used in that, that type of definition in the church, but yeah, in the church and like the man-made denominations. You know, where denominations, they got a lot of man-made traditions. This is something that's heavy, is heavy into that, you know. So, because repentance isn't just turning from sin, but repentance has four major components, you know. And so, even before just turning from the sin, the number one, the number one major component is acknowledging that you have sinned, acknowledging that you have sinned and that you've sinned, acknowledging that to God, you know, so you talking to God and you're like, Lord, you know, I know, 
I messed up, dear Lord. I know I was tempted and I fell into this sin. Father, for, I, I know I did this. I can't even lie to you. I can't even run away from it. You know, I know I did this, Lord. So, number one is acknowledging your sin. That's number one, you know. And once you acknowledge it, you know, it's going to bring you to feeling guilty about it. You know, and that's the conviction. It's convicting you. You feeling guilty about it is going to lead you to ask God for forgiveness. You know, you're going to, Lord, forgive me. I know I'm wrong. I know I'm out of order. Dear Father, I just need you. I need you in my life. I need you to help me, to keep sanctifying me. Lord, I need you to uh, send people in my life and my path that can encourage me, that can build me up. Dear Lord, I need you to keep me focused. You know, so you're going to ask him for forgiveness. You're going to ask him to uh, take those desires away from you to do that and to turn away from that, you know, that you turn away, you know, and also uh, convict you about it, So, which is going to do that. So those four components being convicted, acknowledging it, uh, asking him to turn away from it, and asking him for forgiveness. Those four components is what make up repentance. It's not just one simple little thing like, oh, I could just turn away from sin. It's not like you're just going to turn away. Like, oh, I just turned around like this. Now I'm, I turned away from sin. No, it's not like that. It's major components that play a role in repentance. And that repentance is a fruit of someone who's a born-again believer. Repentance isn't the fruit of someone who rejects Christ and who's an unbeliever. That's not their fruit. They got different fruit. Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. So a born-again believer's fruit is his repentance. Not only is repentance, like also his lifestyle, but repentance is a, a huge part of a born-again believer's fruit. So that's what it would look like. Now, you, you won't see any... Uh, unbelievers doing that, going through all those different steps, crying out to God, feeling guilty. Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to smoke that blood. Lord, I just. You're not gonna catch that. You're not gonna see that. You know what I mean? Unless it's this is somebody who's uh who has been uh seeds planted in them, and somebody been watering it, and God gave the increase. You know what I'm saying? And He's sanctifying them, and they're drawn closer and closer to him, you know what I mean? Like that kind of person, but just like normal, regular people I'm speaking of, you're not going to find them committing all these sins and then feeling guilty and all this kind of stuff. That's not their fruit for them to do that. You know, that that's not in the nature of them. The nature of their flesh is to continue. It is It never, it, 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 it never is complete. It never is satisfied. It wants more, 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 you know, and so that's that's how it is. So, um, born again believers and unbelievers, they have two different um, two different roles when it comes to that. So, I want to go to my script. I'm looking over here because I got my um, I got my scriptures over here that I wanted to go to. Now, I wanted to um, make y'all aware of something. This is a big. Uh, misconception in the Bible about this particular verse and I want to kind of explain it and just get some clarification and to, to edify the body of Christ, to edify believers. Now, 1 John chapter 3 verse 6 says, everyone who remains in him does not sin and everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. So, now, if we were to take that particular scripture for face value, if we was to take that scripture that I just read for face value, then that would mean no one on this planet ever in existence made it to heaven or, or will be making it to heaven. And no one, no one is there currently. No one is there currently and no one will ever be there. If we take this verse for face value, because if I read that verse again, it says everyone who remains in him talking about remains in Christ. Does not sin. 
And everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. So, just think about that last part. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Now, we know every single person that's on this planet is human flesh. All human flesh have sinned. We know this. If you don't know, I'm telling you right now. So, now you know. So, if we take this for face value, that last part condemns every single person on this planet. No one can make it to heaven. And no one in the past days could make it there or be there. So we talking about, just think about the people in the Bible who a lot, a lot of people look at them like these are the greatest uh, patriarchs and matriarchs of the Bible and, you know, and leaders to, to look up to and, you know what I'm saying? Moses, Abraham, Jacob, you know, Isaac, um, you know, all the prophets, you know, Elijah, you know, Daniel, Isaiah, you know, like all of these people, you know, King David. A man of God's own heart. You know, like all of these great people, you know, who in the Bible, you know, uh, 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 Moses seen God face to face, you know. He was called his friend, a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. You know what I'm saying? Like all of these people talking with God, communing with God. And it's not like how it is today where we can't physically, in a physical kind of form, see God and be talking to him like here and there. Like maybe in a vision or a dream he could speak to us and stuff like that. But in the Bible days, he's literally, he's sticking his head out the sky talking to folks. You know what I'm saying? You know, so to speak. And so like he's literally, he's coming out in a bush of fire. He's talking to people. You know what I mean? And like communicating with you. He's not communicating with us in that type of way right now today. And so all of those people who are these great people in the Bible, none of them could be in heaven or ever be in heaven. You know, none of the, the 12 disciples, Peter was his, you know, his number one, his his right hand man. They was like this, you know, none of them could be in heaven or ever be there. If we take this scripture, I just read for face value, you know, it says, Anyone who sins has not seen him and doesn't know him. So that's why it's important to understand scripture in its proper context. So the scripture, and, and a lot of people take it for, oh, this means you don't sin and, and anybody who sinned don't know him. Okay, that means you too. You realize that, right? So we can't take it for face value. What this scripture means in its proper context is people who practice sin. And this is what I was talking about a little bit ago when I said practice sin or willful sin. This is somebody who their lifestyle is sin. And this is an unbeliever because a born again believer doesn't practice sin. You see? So this is in the context of someone who practices sin. And another scripture that's in, in the same context is when, um, when the Pharisees tried to condemn uh, the woman, the adulterous woman. They say, well, look. You know, she she committing adultery. Uh, you know, and Jesus, what did Jesus tell them? He told them to, uh, which, which one of you uh, never sinned, cast the first stone, you know. And so what what is he saying? He's saying, look, all y'all sinned, you know what I'm saying? So how you judging her? This, is, this goes back to Matthew 7, you know. Judge not lest ye be judged. You judging your brother, you know, something in his eye. But look at this big old piece of wood chip in your eye. That's what he's telling them. And so, but then he tells the woman, he say, look, they can't condemn you, neither will I. And he say, go and sin no more. Now, I see a lot of Hebrews, a lot of Hebrews, uh, <laughs> a lot of Hebrews, they would take that verse. I've seen many of them do this. They would take that verse. They will butcher it, butcher the, the heck out of it. And they will say, well, you know, uh, this means you can't sin. Christ said, go and sin no more. So how you still sinning, but you saved and you're a Christian? He said, go and sin no more. For one, that's the same thing as I just told you about this verse, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 6. If we was to take that verse for face value to go and sin no more, nobody on the planet or ever in existence will ever be in heaven or ever go to heaven, period. If we was to take that for face value, that's why we have to understand what Jesus meant in the proper context. 
what he meant in a proper context was people who practice sin. People who have a lifestyle practice of sin. That's what he's talking about. You see? So, um... That's what that's what he means when he says those things. So now a born again believer is not a sinner. So even though a born again believer is saved by the grace of God, he still sins. But how is he not considered a sinner even though he still sins? God doesn't hold he doesn't hold it to our account. So even though we're born again, and we're still human, so we still sin. Even like unbelievers sin, we don't practice sin. So it's a difference of sins. You got a person that sins, and you got a person that practices sins. Two total different things. And so God doesn't hold it to our account. Why? Because we trust in the Savior, the Almighty One, Jesus. This is what um, King David says in Psalms chapter 32, verse 1 through 2. How joyful is the one whose transgression has been forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the man the Lord does not charge with sin. So what does he mean? Every, everything I just said, he just summed it up in that two verses. He just summed up everything I just said in that two verses. That last part he said... Um, Joyful is the man, or blessed is the man who the Lord does not charge with sin. If the Lord is not charging you with sin, that means that someone else is taking on account that sin for you. Because if, if you're not taking it, someone has to. <laughs> this debt has to be paid. So if you're not going to pay this debt, someone else is going to have to pay this debt. In our behalf, Jesus paid that debt. When he was on the cross and he shed his blood for us. So this is what uh, David is talking about. Because we trust in him, that debt has been paid. It has been covered for us. So we don't have to come out of our pocket and have to bear, get on the cross and bear what Jesus bear. We don't have to do that. Jesus did that for us. He covered us. He said, blessed is the one, you know, who God doesn't charge sin to their account you know in revelation he said we get white robes our account our account name you know you go to the bank and, and, and they'd be like okay what's the name of this account my account name it don't say uh jonathan my account name say jesus it say jesus name so when god look at my account and 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 what we would think is oh man i did this 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 and got a whole rap sheet that, that scroll from the ceiling all the way down to the floor and even past there. But when God pick it up and he see it, guess what? It say Jesus at the top of it. And when you look all through there, it's all blank. And it say Jesus at the top. That's what Christ has done for us. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think all that sin is counted to us. No, it's not. And this is what David was talking about. That sin is not counted to us as uh, we come into the Lord and we trust in him. You know what I'm saying? And we bear fruit. And so now we are a born again believer. And not by works. Not by works. But by faith. Okay? So um, I want to go over a few more scriptures with you. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us from all unrighteousness. So, Confessing is what I talked about with the repentance, acknowledging, confessing, you know, admitting, asking for forgiveness, confessing to him. If we confess our sins, which is the same as acknowledging, if we acknowledge our sins to him, confess it to him, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. If we if we confess it to him. So. A born-again believer confesses their sins to the Lord. They don't just sin and that's it and it's a done deal and they just go about their day. No, they confess it. And it's not like they just get up and confess it, but the Holy Spirit convicts them to confess it. And this is what the scripture speaks of in that context. The Holy Spirit convicts them to confess it. Okay? 
Now, if we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, it says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So he said, look, I'm writing these letters to you to uphold you, to exhort you, to motivate you, to encourage you, to stay on the right path, you know, and to not, don't be out there sinning. But if you do sin, we got an advocate. Who is our advocate? Jesus. So he's telling you the same thing David told you just in another way. He's telling you the same thing John told you that I just read. If we confess our sins, he's righteous to forgive us. All of these scriptures are saying the very same thing, just worded a little bit differently. That's it. They all saying the very same thing. Every scripture I just read, you know, so he's letting you know that we have an advocate. Jesus is our advocate if we do sin. So this is the difference between a born again believer and an unbeliever. We have an advocate. Our advocate is Christ, the Messiah, you know. So, but then we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, Therefore, there is no condemnation in Christ. There is no condemnation now that exists for those in Christ Jesus. So when you're in Christ, when you confess his name, you believed in your heart, you accepted him as Lord and Savior of your life, and your lifestyle will bear witness to that. There's no condemnation. No matter what. So there's there this doesn't have this this uh verse doesn't have any limits. Well, there's no condemnation unless No, it doesn't have any of that. It simply said there's there's no condemnation while you're in Christ. So we got a mighty omnipotent God, an omnipresent God. Who you would think that he created all things, all creation. He knows all things from beginning to the end. He's not a man that he should lie. So you would think he would have this all figured out, right? You would think that if he if he set out to give us a salvation, a holy and uh, uh, just a holy redemption, purified, set apart, holy redemption, he set out to give us that. You would think he'd have took into account, well, it might be some people that I, I'm going to bring into this fold. They might slip up from time to time. You would think he would have took that into account, right? And, and have a plan for that. Or have some some type of something to, do, to be able to deal with that or compensate for that. You would think that that's what he had, right? Well, he did. You know, God knows all. He sees all. You know? So, it says in Romans chapter 8. Verse 29 through 30. For those he foreknew, he also predestined. So from the beginning of time, he already knew you. He already predestined you. You know. He said, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So that he would be the firstborn among all brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. You see, so he called us from the very beginning. He already knew that we were going to walk with him. You know, he already knew we was going to be in his fold. And we, and, and we were going to be set apart, you know, and bearing fruit for him. He knew this from the very beginning. And that's why he chose us. He chose us and picked us just like that, right? So, knowing this from the very beginning, he already had a plan. He already had a plan set forth, you know, for when we do sin, when we do slip up. What happens? First, first John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. It tells you right there exactly what, what his plan was. His plan was the advocate. Who's the advocate? Jesus Jesus, Yahshua, he's the advocate. 
So that's the difference when it comes to sin and willful sin. Born again believers, we don't willful sin. And so, um, you know, we all struggle though. Nobody's perfect. We all struggle. No one's perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm a regular person like everybody else. I pray every day and I strive for the Lord. I strive for him, you know, and I have a desire in my heart to seek him and, and to walk this walk for him, you know. And so I've been redeemed in the, the kind of... Uh, the, the way that he flipped, turned my life, my world upside down, is no way I could go back to being the old me, the old man, you know, but now I'm a new creation, you know, so we all need help every single day, you know, nobody's perfect, but all we could do is trust in the Savior, not the flesh, but the Savior, you know, so for anybody out there who are unbelievers or new believers, you know, who was confused about sin and how this whole things work, you know, I just want to uh, do some prayer for you right now. Just have a little bit of prayer, you know, and just ask the Lord to uh, allow you to be able to receive it, you know, and, and get the understanding and pray that this has been fruitful and edifying for you. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy, oh Lord. You are the everlasting God. Dear Father, we put no other gods before you. Oh Lord, we put no other gods beside you. Dear Father, uh, I just pray over uh, this video and everybody who's watching it, oh Lord, um, believers and unbelievers alike, dear Lord, you know what everyone needs. Dear Father, I just pray that those who are unbelievers, dear Father, that you draw them close to you, that they may come to know you, dear Father. Um, and even the believers, dear Lord, uh, you put the tenacity in them, dear Father, in the desire, uh, the strong will to serve you and to surrender, oh Lord, their will for your will. Dear Father, you know what uh, each man needs. Dear Father, I pray that you continue to provide, oh Lord, and you are a righteous God. You always provide. Dear Father, and we believe your promises. You said you will never leave or forsake us. Dear Lord, um, we just pray that you continue working on us daily through this sanctification process, dear Father, and that we continue to grow uh, spiritually and be spiritually challenged, dear Father, that we may grow, dear Lord, and, and not uh, become stagnant. Father, we just pray that uh, you help us be more like you every single day, dear Father, and we just give you all of the glory and all of the praise. Oh, Lord, you alone are worthy of all of the honor. We just pray this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So that's to all my people, all my brothers and sisters. You know, may God bless you. May God keep you. I love you. Peace.